Today's map will be Cedar Mountain. We're going back to using our own troops for this one. That said, it's a single core, of which I can only bring 14 brigades, so a full reorganization right now isn't really necessary. I do need to do a bit of adjusting, however. Let me swap some guys, replace some guys, and get back with you all. So here's the lowdown. Of the 14 brigades we are going to bring, 7 will be infantry, 6 will be cannons, and 1 will be everyone's favorite skirmish brigade, the Snipesimers. The infantry will be a mix of scrub and mid-range squads, though I still won't be equipping any of the newer mid-range teams with upgrades just yet. As for the artillery, 3 of them will be long range, and the other 3 will be close support. So let's see what the stage has for us. It seems that the Federals are not planning to attack soon. However, their presence at Peninsula is a real threat for our capital. We need to develop a bold strategy and strike the enemy's supply line around Manassas. The Federals would be pressed to respond by relocating forces from Peninsula and loosen the pressure to Richmond. Advance rapidly to the north around the right of the Union Army and cut the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, breaking the supply line. Anyone else think the scriptwriter missed a few thes in there? Or maybe Peninsula was supposed to be a proper name? The Yankees have been alerted by our presence and have sent a force to halt our advance. They have occupied that ridge above Cedar Run. You have no choice but to attack and repel them. Good luck, General. Hmm, not really seeing this railroad they want us to cut. Or Mr. Peninsula, for that matter. Ah well, let's get to it. The Union are fully aware of the objective of this map and the terrain involved in it. Other than a skirmish team around here, and a skirmish cavalry at about this spot, the entire rest of the Union are arranged in the woods here, or are moving to occupy the woods here. They also have three cannon batteries located here, each of which are at the maximum size of 24 guns. Or at least maximum size for us. Technically the AI could go larger if it wanted. That second group of enemy infantry, along with the weak point to any defensive line, i.e. its side, is where the opportunity for us will be. I'll be sending three scrub infantry to man the woods here, along with the three long-range cannon batteries to back them up, and a supply wagon. They are the anvil in today's hammer and anvil approach, locking the Union in place while the rest of our forces have all the fun. The cannons on this side will be doing double duty. If the enemy is charging, then the cannons will repel the charge. If the enemy is stationary, then they will use their long-range abilities to hit whichever enemy cannon is most in the open. Within their reach, of course. To assist in spotting, the Snipesimers will be swinging wide and holding to the woods whenever possible. While within forested cover, and with their scoped Whitworths, they should also be able to get in lots of shots on whoever they see while still being out of spotting distance. Who says no one had developed stealth weapons by the Civil War? On the left side, the four other infantry and three close-range cannons will be moving as fast as possible to get into these woods. At a full sprint, your infantry and theirs should arrive within the trees at about the same time. At this point, it's a matter of chasing the Union out. But since their artillery is all over here, and you are bringing large close support batteries with your troops, that shouldn't be an issue. Once the western woods are yours, you can start sliding those forces east to pin the enemy. As you move across the map, be sure that the infantry that is in the wooded area is slightly out in front, so that it takes the brunt of the enemy fire from both infantry and cannon. This brigade is going to be your damage sponge for this fight. I'm going to make sure it's one of my larger 2,000 man brigades, though in hindsight I almost wish I had pushed this brigade up to the 2,500 max for this battle. Also, I had Major General Daniel Hill in charge of it for this playthrough. Given how badly it gets hammered, it may not have been wise to risk my highest experienced guy like that 
but I got away with it, so I'll just claim it was intentional. As the Union gets compressed east, you want to try and take out the three enemy cannon batteries while not pushing them all the way into the heavily wooded northeast corner. While much easier said than done, if you can manage to stop their artillery fire while also having their infantry stand in the open as often as possible, with your own cannons continuously raining fire on them, then you can get the disproportionate casualty numbers on them that we aim for every stage. To help with that, as the army moves east, take two of your southern infantry and have them take up positions in the east just to give the enemy AI pause on moving all the way over. The battle clock in the top right can be safely ignored for this fight. The only clock you want to watch is the main timer in the top center. This stage will end when it reaches 1930, which isn't a ton of time. As such, while certainly possible, I'm not going to be going for a total enemy wipe this stage. Take the objective, eliminate enemy cannons, do all the opportunistic damage I can, and then take the win and move on. To anyone looking at the force distribution bar at the top center of the screen, yes, we are conducting an attack against an enemy that outnumbers us almost 2 to 1 in superior defensive cover. All that really means though is that my cannons will have a target rich environment.
I've mentioned using close support cannons before, but this stage specifically, I'm going to actually be using them as rolling close support. Keep them pressed as close to the infantry in front of them as you can while on the move. Collateral damage be damned, we want big boom. Oh hey, one of their three batteries is in the open with no infantry support. It would be rude of me not to accept their invitation.
two enemy cannon batteries that aren't currently being harassed decide to turn and fire at the Northern Anti-Cannon Brigade. That wasn't exactly what my plan was, but all things considered, that's fine. As long as no enemy infantry manages to plant a volley in my rear, it's actually not bad to have gotten the enemy oversized cannons to waste time rotating a full 180 degrees to take that shot, and then rotate right back after I give the second mid-range team the order to pull back. of ammo. Oh, right, my supply wagon. My skirmisher detachment found what remains of the enemy cannons that the second midrange squad chased off earlier north. Midrange can't get to it anymore due to it now being covered by infantry, but their backside appears to have a juicy bullseye on it. Would be a shame if they got snipes of our sandwiched.
Okay, that move got second mid-range a volley from the Union's nearby infantry. But I think eliminating the enemy cannon battery was worth it overall. Well, this is going swimmingly. The only remaining cannon is in the middle of a large chunk of enemy units, so as I continue to snipe at it, I'm doing all kinds of damage to a bunch of guys.
At this point, Major General Daniel Hill's group is down almost half of its men. Rather than continue to risk him getting hit, I'm going to rotate one of the southern infantry to his place and let him take a reprieve. Did I say I was going to let Hill have a reprieve? I meant I'm going to order him to start marching all around the edges of the map. Whoa there, Sylvester, where are you going?
final cannon down. Now it's just a matter of bleeding them while taking as little return fire as possible. Honestly, I probably should have been moving infantry around to encircle the enemy way before now, but better late than never. Even after all this, I still only have about 25% more troops than they do. 
Given that, I think trying to end this stage on a mass charge would probably cost me more than I'd get out of it. Another shellacking for the Union, with them losing 15,000 men to my 2600. Four of my units took a beating, with Hill's brigade getting the worst of it. Casualties were minimal to all my other forces though, and I'm even back to having every single brigade of mine on top of every single Union brigade on the scoreboard. Woo! Only a single wounded officer, and five promotions, including Hill, who is now the highest rank possible Lieutenant General. A nice array of looted gear, including several hundred each of Lorenz, New Model Springfield, and Harper's Ferry Rifles, and 250 Palmettos. No complaints here. A thousand Enfields and 15 Napoleons ain't bad either. Oh, hey, a star. A post-battle save, because of course. Next up, the second battle of Bull Run. The bonus from doing Manassas Junction is a 20% reduction in the enemy's weapon quality. While that does mean I will have weaker guns to loot post-stage, I'll still take the trade-out of having less severe incoming fire during this bowl of a stage. Alright, put that laugh track audio clip. 